Welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. What follows is horror fiction read in tooth and claw, and not for the faint-hearted. Consider yourself warned. Pseudopod, episode 828, September 16th, 2022. This week's story, Taxitomy, by Shannon Campbell. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host. Your audio production this week is by the amazing Marty, and your story comes from Shannon Campbell. Shannon graduated from the University of Wollongong's creative writing program with distinction. She lives in Wollongong and spends her days as a disability support worker. Her most recent work has been writing episodes for the web series Wolfgang, where a bunch of millennial werewolves battle boredom during their monthly quarantine. That sounds great, I'm so there. And uh, your cast this week is a cast, not an actual reader. We've got a full cast press for this one, and Kitty and Alex moved heaven and earth, and they've done an amazingly good job. So, without further ado, we have a story for you, and we promise you, it's true. Taxitomy by Shannon Grace Narrated by a full cast Taxitomy From the Greek words taxis, meaning arrangement, and toma, meaning corpse. Noun 1. The controversial art of deliberately causing the death of a human as part of a public performance before preparing and preserving the skin of the deceased person. The skin is then stuffed and the body mounted in a lifelike manner. Taxatomist. Noun. 1. An artist who kills a human as part of a public performance before stuffing and mounting the deceased person in a lifelike manner. Synonyms for taxatomist. Red artist. Colloquialism. Babe butcher. Colloquialism. Vulgar. Stiff stuffer. Colloquialism. Vulgar. Muse, noun. 1. Capitalized. Any of the nine sister goddesses in Greek mythology presiding over song, poetry, and the arts and sciences. 2. A source of inspiration. 3. Poet. 4. Colloquialism. A person who allows themselves to be killed as part of a taxitomy performance and their remains to be preserved and displayed. Noah Webster. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary, London, Pocket Books, 1977. There are many misconceptions about the origin of modern taxitomy. Hugh MacLeod, in his seminal work, Liberty, Fraternity, Mortality, outlined the supposed link between the public executions of the French Revolution and modern taxitomy. His conclusions were drawn from the premise that the French citizens' growing enthusiasm for the spectacle of death, as popularized by the guillotine during the terror, led modern Europe, followed by wider and Western society as a whole, to consider death an art form. Dr. Judith Marks refuted MacLeod's findings in her article, Burn the Witch, I'll Bring Marshmallows, stating that public interest in capital punishment as a spectacle existed long before the French Revolution. She specifically cited the executions of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard at the hand of their mutual husband, Henry VIII, as evidence, before focusing on the witch hunts of James I. Professor Derek Hamill would push the taxitomy timeline back even further to the Roman Empire, highlighting the gladiatorial combat of the Colosseum and the persecution of the early Christians, as outlined in his book, Nero, the First Red Artist. I, however, would dispute the claims that any of these events could be considered true taxitomy by the modern definition of the term. While MacLeod, Marx, and Hamill have all given focus to events where death was used as a source of public entertainment, they've neglected to take into account what sets taxitomy apart from modern executions by definition, that is, 
the consent of the muse to be killed. From History in Red by Douglas Fisher Published by the Oxford University Press, 1994 Lisa Montaigne's small apartment in the Sutherland Shire is currently filled with boxes. Most of them were filled days ago, but there are still a few things Lisa has neglected to pack away until the last minute. I am the worst when it comes to time management. Lisa admits while she scrawls the word Benny's on the top of one box in thick permanent marker. I'm always late to work, late paying bills, back at uni. I always finish my essays the day they were due. I'm just hopeless. I thought I'd get better as I got older, but... Instead of finishing her sentence, she sheepishly shrugs at the boxes. Tomorrow, Lisa won't have to worry anymore about being late. She won't have to worry about bills or her job or her appointments or whether the box made it to Vinny's. Tomorrow, she'll be on tour, the centerpiece of Ivan Blakely's latest masterpiece. Tomorrow, Lisa Montaigne will be dead. Uh, People have never understood why this was something I wanted. Lisa says, sitting at her kitchen table with a glass of water. She has been fasting for the past two days to make certain her system is clear. She has read up on the worst taxitomy performances and knows there are plenty of unfortunate muses who have had their last moments ruined by the body voiding itself upon termination. Last meals are not a big thing in the taxitomy community. It's been at the back of my mind since I was a young teenager, maybe 13 or 14. I saw a documentary on it. And I just remember being fascinated by uh, Noel Collins' Prometheus Chained. The way he set up his muse, the expression, the dynamics of it. It felt so real, so alive. And yeah, I know that's completely ironic. You're not the first to have told me that. Lisa talks about having to keep her fascination with taxitomy under wraps around her single mother who found her growing obsession with the art form morbid. She doesn't get it. She still doesn't get it. I've had to cut contact with her because she kept trying to talk me out of it. I mean, I understand why it disturbs her, but sometimes you have to cut out negative people from your life. You can't let your parents' hopes for you stand in the way of your dreams. I ask Lisa whether her mother would be coming to the performance tonight. Lisa shakes her head. She still doesn't get it. I want her to be there, but it's also my night, and I don't want her to ruin it, or worse, try and stop it. It's hard, but I've got some good friends who will be there cheering me on, and also Ivan. I'm so thrilled to be working with him. The man is my rock. Harrison Brown lounges in the leather wing-backed chair that sits in the den of his Edwardian townhouse. He seems anachronistic within his own home. The hand-painted wallpaper and detailed wainscoting clashing with his Doc Martens and raggedy t-shirt. But Harrison Brown is known for his love of fusing disparate elements together. His first production for the Royal Shakespeare Company was a rendition of The Tempest set in Nazi Germany, which divided audiences and was panned by critics. Brown's next production, Henrik Isbin's Dollhouse, was better received, but many theater goers were left questioning whether Brown's choice to gender swap every character was a true commentary on the gender roles critiqued in Isbin's work or simply a shallow gimmick. His latest directorial endeavor is set to dwarf all his other controversies as he prepares to helm his production of Titus Andronicus. The twist? It will be the RSC's first ever taxitomist production. It's what Willie Shakes would have wanted. Titus is probably his goriest play, and there's no way you can truly capture the magnitude of the spectacle unless there are actual stakes, actual deaths. The actors are all amazing sports, especially Lacey Milford, who plays Lavinia. It is such a large commitment for a one-night show. That's why I think it's sold out so quickly. This is literally a -a once-in-a-lifetime performance. (laughs) Particularly for the cast. From 
A Day to Massacre Them All, an interview with Harrison Brown, by James Osborne, published in National Theatre Magazine, Volume 12, Number 27, 14th of August, 2014. Ivan Blakely seems like an odd fit for a taxidermist. He's balding, in his late 50s, with a neat white beard and round face. He looks more like a department store Santa than the suave, genteel, black-suited taxidermist you see on television. When I speak to him backstage of the Sutherland Shire Entertainment Center, he is setting up all the tools he will need for tonight's performance. Mostly, I use the same instruments that I used back when I was a surgeon. Ivan says as he gestures across his assortment of neat scalpels, tongs, and pliers. Honestly, most of this is just for show tonight. The real work begins tomorrow, when I have to start preserving and posing Lisa properly. Not that tonight isn't important. It's a big part of the process, especially for Lisa. I want to make sure that she has the best scent off possible. But that's the glamorous bit. You see, no one likes to talk about the parts with the entrails and the formaldehyde. When I ask him which part he leans more towards, the medical side or the theatrics, Ivan refuses to come down on one side or the other. They're both interconnected. You can't have one without the other. It's like... like asking a baker if he prefers a part where he mixes the ingredients together or when he puts the cake in the oven. It's all the same process. You can't have one without the other. Ivan goes on to talk about the theatricality of the burials of ancient Egyptian pharaohs. How the embalming and mummifying were all part of the spirituality of the process. Priests weren't just holy men. They had a practical, hard, dirty duty to perform for the pharaohs. That's how I see myself in some ways. A modern-day man of Osiris. And believe me, I know how pretentious that sounds. We move on to the topic of what exactly he plans to do with Lisa's remains. Ivan doesn't give me a direct answer. Not because he's being secretive, but because he claims to genuinely not know. I have a few ideas floating around in the back of my head. Concepts I've wanted to try for ages, but I won't know until tomorrow exactly what I want to do with Lisa. Part of it is the practical element. You don't know what a body is going to allow you to do once it's in your hands. That's just the nature of the beast. But alongside of that, I don't want to be pinned down to a specific idea. I like having the freedom to choose the best concept at the time, or even just go where the spirit takes me. Some of my best work has been completely off the cuff. That's why they are called muses, after all. Lewis goes on to say that the major issue facing modern comedians is the increasing absurdity of modern life. Have you ever heard of Poe's Law? She asked me, butting her cigarette. I admit I haven't. It's the idea that no matter how much you exaggerate a point of view for the sake of a joke, there are always going to be people who think you are genuine. Like, if I say that... I don't know, vaccines are full of nanobots and will make us explode once the cyborgs rise up or some shit. I can guarantee there will be one person out there who thinks I'm honestly a tinfoil wearing anti-vaxxer. It's embarrassing when they think you're just that much of an idiot. But it's so much worse when they come up to you after your set and whisper, I believe you. That's what the internet does to your brain though. You think there were half as many flat earthers back in the 50s? 
I can see Lewis's point, but what she refers to as Poe's Law has existed since long before subreddits and YouTube comment sections. Most famously, Jonathan Swift's essay, A Modest Proposal, was written with such sustained, dry irony that it led to a push for cannibalism to be legalized in Ireland, spearheaded by the Oxford Tax Tome Association. The movement only lost momentum when Swift was forced to publicly state he was being satirical. Lewis smiles when I bring up this anecdote. I've heard that. And even afterwards, people still believe Swift was in favor of munching down on some delicious baby stew. From post post satire sounds like something out of a satire. How Felicity Lewis still finds the funny side when the ridiculous is the new normal. By Lily Sue. Published in The Guardian, 19th September, 2009. While Lisa allows the makeup artists and hairstylists to primp and plump her for her big night, she reminisces to me about the first time she met Ivan. <laughs> I sent him a fan mail talking about how I loved his work and how fascinating I found taxitomy. Just silly teenage stuff, you know. I wasn't expecting to get a reply back at all. He was this big shot, amazing artist, and I was just this gawky 14-year-old fangirling in the corner. But he took such a real interest in me. I think it was the first time I remember an adult treating me like an equal. He was just so approachable and nurturing. None of the pretension you'd expect from a taxidermist. Their relationship would remain online for the next few years where the young Lisa would grow to see Ivan as a mentor and eventually confidant. He was there for all the really stupid, petty stuff that goes on in high school. He's been such a major part of my life, I cannot imagine doing this without him. And while I was bothering him with bitch fights in the schoolyard, and which boy broke my heart this week, he was instilling me with this love of culture and art and taxitomy. One time, he spent four hours waxing poetic about the profoundness and beauty of a muse's role and how they give their lives for the sake of future generations. I remember something he said that really struck me. It was, muses may die before their time, but through art they live forever. How amazing is that? Who wouldn't want to be part of that? It wasn't until Lisa was 18 that she and Ivan met in person. I had seen photos of him online, so I knew what he looked like. But it was so much different than meeting him in person. There was that instant familiarity, you know? Like we'd been getting coffee every week for years. It was at that first meeting that he floated the idea of me being one of his muses someday. I was so excited. I can't even describe it. I had been secretly daydreaming about this sort of thing, but I didn't want to blow the friendship by bringing it up to him. Can you imagine how awkward it would have been if he'd said no? But here Ivan Blakely was, offering me a chance to be his muse. I tell you, Cinderella can suck it. That's the fairy tale. The thing with taxitomy is that so many people get wrapped up in the issue of consent. I've heard so many people making the comparison to abortion or to euthanasia. It's their life. They can choose what they want to do with it. Why is it any of your business? This assumes that all consents are made equal. Let's have a look at the statistics for taxitomists and muses. Over 80% of taxitomists are men and 67% are men over the age of 50. Taxitomists tend to be from upper-middle-class backgrounds, with the majority having attended private school, having university educations in law, politics, and business studies. Now, if you look at the muses, it's a very different picture. The gender imbalance is flipped, with the majority being women. 70% are under the age of 25, and 93% are under the age of 35. While you do have a variety of educational backgrounds, most muses earn less than $35,000 U.S. a year before volunteering. 
I find that very interesting, because it not only puts most muses in the lower middle income bracket, or in many cases below the poverty line, but $35,000 is the annual renewal price for a taxotomy license. Most muses get paid less in a year than taxotomists pay to take a person's life. Which leads us to some uncomfortable questions. Firstly, how much do inequality and power dynamics play into a person's choice to become a muse? And secondly, if muses turn towards taxotomy due to mounting inescapable social pressures, can we really pretend that their consent is more freely given than anyone else's? From The Morality of Taxotomy by Wendell Clark TED Talk 11th November, 2017. Lecture. It is half an hour until the performance, when there is a disturbance. Lisa Montaigne's mother, Terry Montaigne, tries to get backstage and stop the performance. Ivan is very used to these types of disturbances. Texatomy is not for the faint of heart. He says airily, as security personnel frog march the struggling, hollering Miss Montaigne outside. You'd hope that family and friends would be supportive of their children's interests, but there are always at least one or two who decide to make it all about them. You expect it, but you never get used to it. I've been threatened legally, verbally, physically. I had one muse's father try to set the theater on fire. It makes me furious. But what can you do? All you can do is channel your work into your art. If that makes the detractors angry, then all the better. Lisa comes out to see what the commotion was but Blakely handles the situation and tells her it was a frustrated lighting technician. When I ask him why he didn't tell Lisa about her mother's presence, he waves a practiced hand. This is Lisa's big night. Knowing that her mother is here and try to pull a stunt like that will only get in her head. I remember something similar happening in one of my first performances, and the muse got cold feet. We had to shut down the whole thing. If Miss Montan isn't here to support her daughter, she doesn't need to be here at all. It is twenty minutes before curtains up, and I give my final goodbyes to Ivan before going to do the same to Lisa. We both seem to simultaneously realize this is the final time we will see each other. Lisa wraps me up in a massive bear hug. Thank you for writing this article, Lisa says in my ear. It helps a lot, you know. It's good to know people are going to know who I was and why I feel this is important. I hope it helps people understand. On the dressing table, I catch a glimpse of a photograph. It's of a woman and a girl, obviously related. The girl, like the woman, is on the plumper side and has a few prominent blemishes on her nose and forehead. If it weren't for the wide, natural smile and the mole under her left eye, it would be almost impossible to tell that the girl in the photo was the same person as the woman hugging me. I ask whether break a leg was a term taxotomists use. Lisa admitted she didn't know, but she's sure it'll work the same anyway. From Interview with a Work of Art by Sally Ambrose, published in Artist Quarterly, Volume 6, Number 27, 2019, pages 16 through 25. Renowned taxidermist Charles Green has had his appeal to overturn his conviction of murder in the first degree dismissed today and will face sentencing within the coming weeks. Green's case made international headlines when it was discovered that he allowed his taxotomy license to lapse, leading the family of his latest muse, Virginia Wilkins, 
to claim her death was unlawful. This has sent shock waves through the taxidermist community who claim that Green's sentencing is a miscarriage of justice. In a statement to the public, Linda Flynn, the head of the American Taxotomy Association, said that this is a clear case of bias on behalf of the judge and the legal system as a whole. While Mr. Green was obviously in the wrong for allowing his license to lapse, treating this case as though it were a back alley murder instead of a performance done with Miss Wilkins' full knowledge and consent is ludicrous. We support and will continue to support Mr. Green in this matter. This is not the first time Taxotomy has found itself under legal scrutiny. In 2017, Canadian taxotomist Gladys Stewart came under fire for coercion after attempting to secure muses by contacting terminally ill cancer patients and offering to pay undisclosed sums of money to their families upon their dying as part of her performance work. With the push to criminalize taxotomy in the United States gaining momentum, cases like Charles Green's only muddy the waters further. From Green Appeal Dismissed a clear case of bias, says American Taxotomy Association, by Jordan Barrett. Published in the Liberty Herald, 12 December 2018. Ivan Blakely's new taxotomist work, The Ascending Beatrice, is meant to be an homage to Beatrice Portinari, the inspirational, almost sanctified figure immortalized in Dante's Divine Comedy. Unfortunately for Blakely, and facts that taxotomy as an art form, the work lacks the glorious and inspirational quality such a title should inspire. While technically the work is on par with Blakely's other more notorious pieces, such as his Prometheus Chained and his Black Taxotoma series, a recreation of the infamous black paintings of Francisco Goya, the ascending Beatrice lacks the creativity and nuance of Blakely's earlier works, coming across as stilted and gaudy rather than divine and majestic. The expression and positioning of the muse is reminiscent of an unloved store mannequin that has been repurposed to play Mary in a slapdash nativity scene. Blakely admits his disappointment in the ultimate product, claiming that the muse wasn't right for this particular work. The ascending Beatrice was set to be the centerpiece for the National Gallery of Australia's newest exhibit of Dante-inspired artwork, to be set alongside the works of Rossetti, Rodin, and Botticelli. But unlike the works of those masters, it is unlikely to become a significant piece in its own right. From The Ascending Beatrice Falls Short by Damian Arnold A review of The Ascending Beatrice by Ivan Blakely Published in Living Art Magazine, 12 August 2019, pages 44 through 62 Oh boy, did this one creep up on me. Wow. There is a peculiar kind of language that only ever gets bandied around in the highest of high society intellectual fight clubs. You know the sort of place where postmodern ironic hot takes are like the coins from John Wick, only murderously annoying and no one actually feels anything. They don't know how. They just say they do. The brilliant thing is, Right now, a lot of you are thinking of a dozen extremely online opinion havers who would absolutely be in the audience for this performance. The horrifying thing is none of you were thinking of the same dozen. Campbell's fake pull quotes here? Oh my god, I was sure I'd read one of those articles. I've certainly been in rooms with people who've said stuff like, a modern day man of Osiris and then assured me they know how absurd that sounds, even as they preen and make it clear that they believe it with every fibre of their postmodern, ironic, detached being. This is the first hit of horror, for me, anyway. The realisation that these people are only ever one artistic murder away from... this. An atrocity with an audience. Where things get meta is in how that exact sort of bullshit attention-grabbing nonsense grabs your attention. It's brilliant and horrifying, because the moment you look past these bloody-handed soft boys, you remember this is a story about murder as art, death as performance. A life is being ended here as a means of anchoring the temporary nature of performance art in the gristle 
of the human body. Look closer and you see something even worse. No one sees this as a horrific event, except perhaps the muse, and even then she's so lost in the irony space of the sociopaths she is sacrificing herself to that the thought of doing something else never fully coalesces. But my god, it tries. And that's the worst part. What haunts me about this story is the bad reviews. And not just because the idea of trivialising the end of a life down to meh, 3 out of 10, is the sort of horrifying that shortcuts the rational brain and jumps straight to boundless rage, but because of why the art doesn't quite work. Because she was terrified. Because she knew it was wrong. And she did it anyway. And it didn't matter. Except, perhaps, for one thing. Art is truth. Whatever truth you find in it is there for you. Art is truth. And in the final moments of her life, she writes the truth of her death into the art she is becoming part of. An act of rebellion, an act of desperation, but the act of an artist and the act of a human. Damn, this is good. Thanks to all. Oh, hey. Hi. Didn't see you there, because we're on a audio-only podcast. Did you know this show is one of five? Escape Pod, Pseudopod, Podcastle, Cast of Wonders, and Cat's Cast. It's an amazing team of people, and as I enter the first straight of my 16th year doing this, I am stunned and honoured to work with them all, and with you, because we do work with you, believe me. We rely on you to pay our authors, cover our server costs, and frankly every other cost. We're now at the point where we are paying everyone, and that's a major benchmark because we believe everyone who works in this field should be rewarded for their time. Without any element of our staff, from editors to authors, hosts to producers to slush readers and associate editors, the whole system collapses. Everyone is needed. Everyone deserves to be paid. And that's where you come in. We are painfully aware that times are tough and getting tougher. But if you can help out, please do. You can donate any amount you want, or subs start from five bucks a month through PayPal and Patreon. They get you access to the support bonus content as well, including Pseudopod Extrusions, which is a whole other stream, and extra episodes of Cat's Cast. It's a really good deal. You get things, you give us money, we use that money to make more things you get. It, it's a win-win. So, if you can help out, please do. We will be back next week with Carlo Jaeger Rodriguez in the hot seat and Marty running the audio magic. The story will be We've All Gone to the Magic Show by Todd Kiesling and narrated by the mighty John Paget. It'll also be, as it is now, a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives license. We're going to leave you with a quote from one of my favourite movies that I used to end a lot of these shows on. I don't think it's ever been more relevant, though, than to this story. This is, of course, from David Lynch's, I would argue, best work, Mulholland Drive. No hey banda, and yet we hear a band. We'll see you next time, folks. Until then, have fun. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.